Oops. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm just waiting for Lauren to join me. Sorry. Oh God, I keep doing it. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm um, I'm just waiting for Lauren to join. I um, am trying to pin something but turns out that's quite difficult okay i'm gonna give up on the pin <laughs> um thanks for everyone for joining um i'm gonna be chatting to lauren singer of um the package free shop and trashes for tossers about all things sustainability and different tips that we can be doing at home um and just about each of our lives so i'm gonna wait for lauren to come on. And also if people have um, questions, um, I'm sure after we've asked the ones that we've outlined, we'd love to answer a few of them. So maybe put some in the comments or when we come to that bit, maybe I'll ask everyone. People are asking, how am I? I'm very good. How is everyone doing? <laughs> People said, what makes Osea different than other organic brands? Um, well, I think why I like Osea is because all of the, the predominant ingredients are all from the ocean, the water, um, and they are very, very conscious in the way that they harvest um, the ingredients that they use in their products, which um, is why I love using them. And I'm obviously, as you probably know, a big ocean lover, so my skin also loves um, to use those ingredients. If anyone has, I mean, there's more like specific OCA product questions. I would probably DM them for questions like that because I am not sure, I'm afraid. What have I been up to in this time? Um, I have been... Um, Continuing on with my projects that I was already working on, a lot of them are kind of in development writing stages, a uh, mixture between a first feature film that I'm working on um, that has an environmental edge to it and also two books that I've been meaning to sit down and write the proposals for. So I've been doing that. One is a fiction book and one is a non-fiction book. Uh, again, stuff that's very um, related to the environment, but in kind of very different genre kind of ways is what I've been working on. So again, just if you're joining, I'm Bonnie Wright and we're just waiting for Lauren Singer to come on and we're going to talk about things, all things sustainability, uh, be that just practices we um, keep in our own homes and also uh, how this relates to the work we do. Uh, Lauren has a great company called The Package Free Shop in New York, in Brooklyn. Um, and yeah. I'm going to chat to her, but I'm still waiting for her to join. I think she's maybe having some internet issues, but she's coming. Mm -hmm. 
call her and put her on speaker. I could do that, but then you won't see her face if I call her and put her on speakerphone. Um, we're still waiting. Um, okay, another question. Uh, tell us more about your day, your rituals that you've been keeping you sane. Well, I have been reading out loud a lot in the morning. I've been reading um, poetry. I started by sharing some of these on my Instagram stories, um, but felt I was on my phone a little bit too much, so I've just been doing this for myself. But I find if I start by reading something out loud in the morning, I can just like hear myself and get my vocal cords going and not kind of become too small in this kind of closed environment of my home. Um, but I'm sure like everyone, it's uh, ups and downs. We start these like, you know, new rituals or practices and then we can often slide away from them and not become so good at keeping them up. And I think it's important that we just be gentle during this time and not get too frustrated if we don't perfectly continue all these new practices we have to do. Any cooking? Yeah, I've been doing lots of cooking. I luckily love cooking anyway a lot. So this has been even more of a time for me to, um, to do that. Uh, I also just literally yesterday planted my own little vegetable garden. Um, so again, sorry, we we're still waiting for Lauren, but um, she's still uh, having some issues with her internet that's being a bit um, pr unpredictable. Um, so we are hanging on. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, I can happily ask them. Um, hot cross buns. I did bake hot cross buns, but they didn't, the crosses disappeared on them. Um, what did I plant? I planted, uh, lots of herbs. Um, I planted butternut squash, zucchini, romanesco, lots of different types of green beans, potatoes, beetroots, um, nasturtiums to sort of attract the bees and pollinators and hopefully help with pest control um, and all of the, I managed to find, oh, wait, we might have some luck. I think Lauren is about to join us. Oh, there we go. Hello. I was <laughs> you to talk about your garden. Oh, yeah, I'm just like chatting away, not knowing if anyone's listening. Um, thank you. Hello. How wow, it's lovely you? where you are. Uh, I'm good. I was just, yeah, talking about what I've been up to, which seems productive some minutes and not productive other minutes. How about, how are you? Good. Came upstate to get some fresh air. Nice. Very nice. good for the brain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I feel very fortunate that I can be outside and it, the sun is shining here. How's LA? It's good. Um, it's kind of one of those cities that actually is quite already designed to be quite isolated. You know, even if you do have to go out, you're kind of yep. in your car or in, you know, you've got more space at home. So I think that doesn't feel too different um, in terms of like, I feel like it's actually busier on my street than it is usually because everyone's <laughs> at home because you're in, when you're in a suburban area, most people will leave to go to work. So it's almost more people walking around. Um, wow. but, yeah. I'm so excited to see you yeah. and to talk to you. I know, me too. And I'm thank pleased. you uh, to everyone watching for being here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So Lauren and I, I guess, I feel like we've, I can't remember when we first, oh yeah, we first met when I invited Lauren to speak on a panel that I did with Greenpeace um, at this plastic free picnic idea that I came up with. Um, and Which was so amazing. Yeah, it was great. We had the Greenpeace ship docked in Long Beach. And we did like a panel around the picnic. It's the first time I met Amy as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of the first times I connected with Oliver English. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. And we made a beautiful plastic-free picnic. Yeah. It's an amazing thing, I think, because I think we often, we have all these ideas and, or like ideas to shift habits and inspire change and things. And I think if you actually have to also show up to an event having changed or like thought about changing a habit i think it's a good like tangible thing to show up trying to bring a picnic free of plastic 
Totally. In a way, it's kind of nice to have, I mean, there's nothing nice about COVID, but, you know, you and I have connected more through this than we probably would have otherwise, just through like going back and forth to LA and New York. And I feel like that's the same with so many people um, all across the world. Ooh, it is Bug Central Station here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is, it is nice to just like have that catalyst to connect more. Definitely, before. yeah. And I think, I mean, technology as as kind of scary and overwhelming it can take over our lives at the same mm -hmm. time. Like it completely allows us to still be mobilized, doing things, creating things, having conversations and yeah. and reimagining like the format in which we work. I think it's been I've definitely had some really interesting conversations during this time that I just never would have maybe made time for or thought to do. Definitely. I mean I think about it too, it's like the first pandemic well really for, for most of us but like the first major global catastrophe that's been interconnected through the internet which is really interesting like yeah definitely like every bit of information in the whole world right now yeah which is kind of in this space that is hard to like navigate and filter that's for sure mm -hmm. and definitely can be times when like too much is too much and and just the seeking the transparency in it i guess like people being i think very aware of asking questions and i think that's what's so around you know the environment and sustainability a lot of it is about that is about transparency and asking questions of like where does this come from and oh i've never even thought about a supply chain and all these things which are becoming more like seen i think that's so interesting i wonder if after this like you know, people, people have been, I've been seeing people post about how much screen time they're using, mm -hmm. right? And I think everyone is pretty much at their screen time, all time, maximum, yeah. lifetime high. Uh, and I wonder if after this screen time will start going down or if we'll rely on the internet for certain things more like food delivery, but less for like Instagram, because we just want to spend more time outside. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to see how the world yeah. goes towards technology after this. I think it definitely will. I mean, even me, I, I can easily just see how more present I am to like simple things that, that can happen outside when I'm walking. I'm suddenly just so much more appreciative of things. Um, I do hope that like that lasts. I think it will. Um, and so I'm going to ask some, I'm going to jump in with a question Let's for people it. who, um, maybe new to you and what you do with your site trashes for tosses and also package free shop um so would you mind telling us all a little bit about the package free shop and how you came to start it sure um so package free shop was kind of a a result of two things that i started in the past one was trashes for tossers which is the instagram that i'm on now and um a blog that tries to show that individuals have power to uh, have an impact on the planet and specifically I focus on reducing waste because I feel like it's a really great way as an individual to use your power uh, to have a positive impact on the planet and to reduce climate change so it shows that living a zero waste or low waste lifestyle can be actually easy contrary to what a lot of people think it can be um, cost effective and save you money um, and it can be fun so I started that in 2012 um, and then from there, I started my first company, which was called The Simply Co., which we're actually relaunching soon, which is really exciting. It's a free ingredient organic vegan laundry detergent. And that was really born because um, I was making all of these products through Trashes for Tossers and living a zero waste lifestyle that um, were as simple as they could be, as clean as they could be. And a lot of people that were following me wanted these products, but they felt like they didn't have the time to make them themselves. They mm -hmm. thought that you know, making your own products is, is, is really expensive in the time uh, sense. And so I, I thought that was really, you know, definitely valid because we have so little time, maybe now more than ever, we have a lot of time. Um, but when we're going through our normal lives, just finding time to like make toothpaste or make deodorant or make laundry detergent isn't a priority for everyone. Um, and, and I think that's kind of unfair 
and the reason that I think that's unfair is because you go into most stores and there's not access to products that are as clean and simple as the ones that you can make yourself. So I started Simply Co to make it more convenient and accessible for people to have products that are as simple as the ones that you can make yourself. Um, and through Simply Co, I started meeting all these really amazing brands that were also creating products that help people reduce waste, live more in alignment with a sustainable planet, um, and realized there was no place to get all of these products in one convenient location. So that's kind of how Package Free was born. Our mission is to make the world less trashy, and we sell a huge variety of products that help you reduce waste in your everyday life. Cool. I think I think it's interesting when, you know, obviously we think things take time to make ourselves in that DIY way, and this time has definitely given us that time to maybe do those things we always meant to try ourselves or make but i i think what's great about what you've done is essentially you know you're still working in a commercial space you're selling products that a lot of people do want to find that people want to find alternatives and i think people like to be consumers like however you know the consumer society is can kind of be a failing to to the planet and to ourselves i think also I don't think it would be like a utopia if we ever like didn't consume. So I think people do actually enjoy buying products, but if we can be more conscious consumers anyway, and stick with the way we like operate as society, but actually not feel bad for everything we buy. I think people can feel like the positive buzz of buying something that's good. It can like make them feel like yeah. they're part of something. Yeah. I mean, it's just like totally unrealistic to expect a person to make every single thing they, they use in their life and to make it like super well. You will never be like the best baker, the best cook, the best DIY skincare maker, the best, you know, teacher all at the same time. And that's why, you know, uh, commerce and, and capitalism started was to kind of, you know, put these skill sets into people who are really qualified and, and, and so people could do other things, grow their talents, and we could evolve technologically and as a society. And I think, um, you know, to your point, I, I wish everyone made everything themselves, right? I wish that everything was as clean and as simple. Um, that's not the case. And, and because time is such a valuable uh, thing, you know, it's just not possible. But, but that's what I saw really was that it was so hard to find things that were as simple as the products that you could make yourself that were clean. And um, even if, even looking into like, you know, I'm so inundated in product at package free and it's so hard still to find products that align with my values of, you know, being plastic free, being all organic, being vegan, um, you know, shipping without plastic, all of these, these things that, um, you know, are so to me like essential for, for creating a better uh, future, but it's, it's still so hard now even to find those products. So that's really what we, we wanted to do at Package Free, just make it more convenient and really invite other brands to to look at the foundation that we set for what I believe a product should be and start to align with our values. So we've helped a lot of our companies actually transition away from a lot of their old practices into new ones and have a more positive impact. But there's such a long way to go with consumer products. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much misinformation and so much confusion that it's really hard to navigate um, the landscape of consumer products. So I try to make it a little bit easier for people through package free because I vet everything, but, but it's hard out there. You don't know what to believe. Yeah. Sometimes. I think it's hard as well. I mean, the, the kind of greenwashing and using so many kind of buzzwords and languages around things can confuse people um, who are really trying to make good choices, but are also up against people who are just trying to sell products, which is this hard thing because it's, great that these things have become more fashionable essentially to be into and care about but then naturally like there's going to be some companies that don't maybe vet everything as well as you do or kind of become so conscious of every step i mean there's definitely been times where i thought i've made a conscious choice buying something and then it shows up in packaging that i don't agree with and, and it can be so frustrating Totally. Especially when an item that you're looking at is like at the forefront of, you know, millennial consumer dialogue Definitely, and yeah. it's like touted as being so sustainable. But I look into most like venture backed millennial consumer products that are like sustainable and they're not. And it's just yeah. really frustrating for me as someone who cares about this so much, like so many of us. Um, and, and 
is just like, wow, you guys are all being duped and it's so unfair. And I think people who are behind the companies, I mean, even like when you think of, um, you know, you speak to your local coffee shops and cafes and talk to them about the cups that they sell their coffee in. And, and obviously so many plant-based plastics have exploded onto the market. Mm -hmm. But the sad truth of those is that they need to be predominantly composted in industrial machinery, not just throw it in the earth in your garden and it'll come. So I think with that, they are like, oh, wow, we didn't even know that. They didn't really quite explain that to us. We thought we were making a really good choice and felt really proud of it. So it's, 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 definitely, um, it's definitely challenging when the, the kind of intention is there, essentially. But it's like maybe everything needs to catch up to that intention. Like it's not quite there yet, the industry or the all materials, I think. Well, and I think that's a big risk of all of this new like material innovation that's happening, like creating plastics out of who knows what and mm -hmm. um, packing materials that are so new to the like the other end of things, which is like the recycling and landfill infrastructure that people don't know what to do with it. And at the same time, yeah. like, there's no regulation over what's created, manufactured and put out into the market. Like in America, we're the absolute worst at regulating anything. Um, so you can, as a creator, be like, I want to make plastic out of seashells. And then you release it into the market and it's going to go to landfill because there's no back end system yeah. to actually compost it. Even if you can say like, it's totally compostable. And if you do, and it's not like, there's no one that's regulating. There's no one that's saying, it's bad um, yeah exactly and it's and it's really confusing I see someone asking a question if you don't mind about like how to know what's actually recyclable and I know you talk yeah, about yeah. this a lot as well um, and it's so complicated because every single place has different recycling capabilities so like mm -hmm. you know you're in Los Angeles and even within Los Angeles there are some places that compost some places that recycle the bins are different colors in different places every city has a different system um, so even if something says it's recyclable, that doesn't mean that it will be recycled in the actual place that you're living. So it's, it's super complicated. Yeah, and I think it's difficult. I mean, in our lifetime, you know, I remember as a child, it was very much like something you were told that, okay, we, you know, recycling is a good thing. This is what we're going to do. And so your whole life, you think that's what you're meant to do and it's good. Yep. And then you realize actually the system is completely oversubscribed and there isn't enough they're just there's too much plastic for it to be recycled and it's not an infinite loop so you suddenly have to rewire parts of your brain that have told you know that have been told recycling is good and realize that like unfortunately recycling is not gonna we can't recycle our way essentially out of the issue and it's more about like stopping kind of virgin raw new plastic being made. I mean, that's the work that I do with Greenpeace. Like a lot of that is really trying to connect the plastic industry with the fossil fuel industry because often they aren't seen for a lot of people as, as the same thing. You know, mainly we think of fossil fuels as, as you know, basically cars and planes and, and things like that rather than actual plastics and packaging. So mm -hmm. that is a lot of the things that how do you connect that narrative and make people realize this same people are essentially behind a lot of these industries? Yeah. And that the, the things like, you know, I, I've, I've totally fallen victim of being like oil spills are terrible. Um, the oil and gas industry sucks. And that's kind of like what started my journey because I realized like, I hate the oil and gas industry, but wait, everything in my house is packaged in plastic. And I didn't realize or like connect the dots that mm. oil, is what yeah. turns into plastic. Yeah. And so if you don't like oil spills, if you don't like, you know, climate change, if you don't like deforestation, if you don't like drilling and all of these things, um, you know, we have to move away from the products that are made from these materials and, and that's plastic. But I think it, mm -hmm. it's intentionally confusing, I think. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, it, during this time, I don't know how you found it, but so many practices that I kind of, do in my purchasing habits for my food you know are kind of as package less as i can manage through buying bulk and buying loose vegetables and going to the farmer's market all these things that i know are such a privilege that i have access to but during this time all those facilities particularly like bulk food shopping is closed for obvious reasons of, of cleanliness but it just shows that I don't like at the beginning, I think loads of plastic companies like jumped on that to basically be like, 
plastic's the cleanest thing you could be, you know, use more plastic, it's so clean kind of thing. And you're just like, well, I mean, yes, I understand that we don't want to put our hands in bulk bins right now, but it's a shame. I guess my fear was that will we undo work that we've been doing towards a kind of a, a reusable world, which is kind of like we both agree is the kind of future. I mean, that's the question, right? Like, are people going to be afraid of refilling cups for the foreseeable, foreseeable future? But also, at the same time, like, if you're someone who went and got coffee every day and you're staying inside and you started making it yourself, maybe you just won't even go to the coffee shop anymore. Yeah. And so, you know, there's, there's that side of it, too. So I think there's, like, the, the one end, which is, like, everything in bulk, everything package-free, everything reusable. And then there's the middle ground of, like, you know the disposable or compostable cups then there's just like just make it at home yourself and i think a lot of us are realizing it's so much easier than we thought and we we save so much money at least for me like something that i feel really grateful for is this happening during a really good time of year for food in at least in, in yeah, New York. And you're lucky in california because there's four growing seasons effectively and here you know there's there's kind of um but we're in spring right now and and being in New York City, the farmers markets are still open. Um, you know, the farm stands up here are still open. And so I'm able to eat totally seasonally. And I think that's something we forget about. Like seasonal produce is typically available without packaging and you're supporting local farmers. So even these practices that, um, you know, that, that might not seem like, oh, this makes sense, actually contribute to sustainability and, and a really amazing system. And it's available uh, during a crisis. Definitely. And I think just supporting your like local small businesses has become so much more um, a thing in all in all kind of uh, areas, not just food and stuff. I feel like friends here in L.A. have, you know, always sharing like a company they found to buy something from locally that will kind of deliver, hand deliver. And I think people are becoming as their lives are more kind of vulnerable. They realize how many small businesses are, too. So I do hope that that. I mean, there are things that I've started new that I will definitely continue after what? this has happened. Um, well, I usually always go to the farmer's market and they are still open, but I've been getting like a CSA box that I get like every 10 days. And I've just so enjoyed a, I never know what's going to be in it. Like I, which kind of challenges me to like cook something different. And um, the way the method of picking it up is just so easy and there's like multiple times a week I can do it whereas for me like there's one day that the farmer's market is on nearest me and if I miss that day I'm like oh you know I've then kind of so it's just super accessible and the way they've created their online system is just so great whereas so I think the small businesses who have harnessed their like online ordering will be really good and I'm growing as I was saying my own vegetables so maybe I'll slowly be self-sufficient um i also talking about i mean on the flip side of plastics and, and and packaging which can be overwhelming i do think a really i know new york rules have slightly changed recently but composting is obviously uh an incredible way that we can lower our waste we can redirect waste out of landfill lower methane all these things um and i do think it's like one positive uh easy way to inspire people i know that you're a big composter yourself how is the challenge is like my can you favorite 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 thing i mean like composting in menstrual cups and, and I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> um and i you know composting in new york city the the municipal program was actually halted on my birthday on may 4th um, oh, no. city, which is which is really sad sorry there's like some major bees flying around um which is good <laughs> Um, and that was super sad. Um, but at the same time, there are all these really amazing community programs that I think actually probably do it better because it's not industrial composting. It's, mm -hmm. it's smaller scale composting, which I think is really great. But a lot of people are learning, like, um, I know Lucy Biggers just set up her compost. I've been watching her stories. And, um, you know, if you have a yard, which even in New York, a lot of people do, not a lot, but people do in Brooklyn, um, you can set up composting. If you have a friend that has a yard, you can come together as a community and set up composting. But composting reduces methane, which is more potent than carbon dioxide as a warming gas. So it's like the best thing that you could do for the environment. 
um, in the short term and the best thing you can do for climate change because food waste is one of the biggest contributors. I mean, aside from not eating meat and not using oil and gas, but we don't really have much control over that at all. Um, but I, I mean, I love composting and since it's been stopped upstate or in New York City, I've been trying to look for local solutions and then luckily I'm able to come up here um, and, and bring my compost to my cousin's house who actually uh, is composting. Yeah, and if anyone is in LA, the LA Compost is a great um, local drop-off place that you can go to. They have quite a few across LA, and I know they're still open during this time. Um, yeah, I mean, I have friends who have composting little bins on their balconies of their apartments, yeah. or, you know, I have one in my garden. I used to always drop mine off, and then um, I moved somewhere that I would have a little bit more space, so I have started my own. I haven't actually got it to the stage that I'm going to start putting it on my plants, so... It'd be interesting to see. I think I want to start, my, my next task is to start segmenting my compost into things oh, that okay. can be like turned into broth or like a treacle or something like that. Oh yeah, I did it the other week. I made a broth with my you food did. scraps. Yeah, it was, um, it was pretty, it was surprisingly good. I had like beet um, ends in it. So it was like bright red, which looked great. And Ooh. then I like cooked some beans in it. It was pretty good. And it was the first time I had done that to get like a second life out of the scraps. I love that. And even like, what have I been doing lately? I've been making these veggie burgers and you, um, you just grind up like the full vegetable in a food processor. And I'm like, mm. why? When I first made it, I like caught myself cutting off the ends. And I was like, why the hell am I doing this? Yeah, put it all in. <laughs> like, these are good. Like, these are fine. Why am I? I don't know. Like, where did that come from? I don't yeah. Even, like, cutting well, like, off I love making it. pesto with all random odds and ends of the, the ends of um, greens and things. Um, I wonder if anyone has any questions, because I think, I can't remember, I think you're allowed an hour on this. Anyone got any questions? I think they changed it, which is actually good. Oh, they did? Go okay. Um, well, let me see what other questions What do I see what people are asking? I'll look too. Um, oh, I saw someone talk about natural dyeing, which I haven't done yet, but I really, really want to do. Yeah, I have never, natural. I only had naturally... No, I've never, I mean, honestly, the last time I remember doing that was like at school, I think, like dyeing paper and like aging it with coffee and stuff. Um, like turmeric dyeing. Let's yeah. Else. How do you make your own veggie broth? Well, actually, I videoed myself doing this veggie broth thing and Greenpeace are putting it on their site like next week, I think. So I'll share it on my page and it's really just like you put some water in a pot and you put the vegetables basically in. i mean just like, any what? scraps <laughs> yeah. and it's kind of cool because every week it'll, or every time you make it, it will taste different according to the scraps you've had mm -hmm. i advise people either who don't oh people, well after you have the compost you can then put it into your own plants as a kind of f fertilizer and it helps them grow yeah a lot of i see some a question about like living with people who don't shop plastic free or like oh yeah yeah i would say that's even a bigger one of like align with your values i think a lot of people are are struggling right now with um you know being next to people 24 7 and mm -hmm. if their values don't align that's really confusing i think i always approach that from the perspective of control what you can um and try to talk about why you you want things to be different as opposed to just being upset that they're not um and also you know if you live with your parents and they're grocery shopping i don't know how old you are the the person that asked this question but like can you go to the grocery store too in the future i mean right now our priority should be just like staying safe staying at home um but in the future you know maybe maybe now's the time to say like to your parents while you're spending so much time why it's so important for you to reduce your waste and live sustainably um and i think that motivating like to see that it's something parents want to make their children happy right um and to to show them that it's something that makes you feel so happy that makes you feel passionate i think it's really empowering as a parent i know i mean i am not a parent but if i were a parent um, you know, and my, my child was super passionate about something, I would, I would definitely want to lean into that. And I think just communicating that in a way where you're not like, you suck because you use plastic. You're like, I would love to experiment with not using plastic because, um, you know, I care about climate change and it's so easy. And I saw these tips and lead with like tangible suggestions for how to reduce waste. And if they don't want to do the plastic bag thing, then like, maybe there's something else that you can try to reduce waste in your own life, what you can control. Yeah, I do think that I think if you just, in the joy that you find in those like practices that you like that are more kind of 
sustainable and don't use the packaging and things i think that joy becomes like infectious i think you can only lead by example of just enjoying something rather than kind of complaining if someone isn't doing it or forcing it down them as, as a thing they have to be doing um i do often find that people just see you know i think often we don't see the the ripple effect of of change you know if you walk down the street with your reusable coffee cup and granted not right now but in days gone by and in the future if you walk down with a smile on your face and you're enjoying your coffee someone might have walked by you and thought oh i forgot to bring my coffee this morning that like reminds me tomorrow i'll bring my coffee cup and you're never going to see that action that they just Hold took on. but you know it you know it's just happening as a as I a mean, kind of change it's so true. it's like the power of, of influence as well like especially you know if you walk down the street of la and you look chic and cool and you're wearing you know your christy dawn dresses or whatever <laughs> um, and you have this reusable coffee cup people are going to be like i want to be this girl this is so cool um so i think that's such a good point like just you don't sometimes you don't even have to talk to people to, to influence yeah. just by like being a person and being a champion of your values and um just just existing can can inspire them as well and I think in, and it, for me, you know, obviously I, it, within my kind of work as a filmmaker, you know, this has massively influenced my work. So I think that's the same with everyone in their own job, whatever that may be. I think you can bring in these similar kind of uh, ways that you, lens in which you like look at life through and things that you kind of care about or are curious around. I think you can let that sort of seep into other areas of your life not just your home habits i think it can like question yeah. you know the company that you work for and, and how sustainable they are or maybe just like suggestions of changing things in the in the coffee room or the way they maybe print too many documents and i think it can spread I mean, even in film I, I don't know if you're i know you read a lot more than i do but i've been like voraciously consuming videos and media and tv shows and movies and the amount of single-use plastics in all of that is so insane like i want the film industry to move away from allowing single-use items in films like what an amazing way to to change that up if you see your favorite you know actor using a reusable in a tv show uh yeah i, I saw in a tv show i was watching the other day and the character the main character had like a reusable cup in it and it made me happy to see yeah um but yeah i think for sure i mean the idea you know days gone by product placement in films was like a huge way that you finance things by kind of flipping to a watch that they're wearing and it's some brand and i think it's the same with uh um, how you can influence people through the main way in which we consume culture is film and TV. I mean, my goal to make for my first feature film is to create an entirely zero waste set. So it's going to be an interesting Ooh. challenge. Um, I was yeah, doing I mean, a lot of research on that because I was I was talking to a, a set that I wanted to to help make more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some really cool for anyone that's watching that is in film. There's like what is it peach and pear these standards for for creating lower waste uh sets yeah there's uh, also an organization called earth angel that yeah. production companies can hire to kind of come and make sustainable because i think you know you obviously got the kind of catering department and all those things that you want to make but i'm also so interested in how do you do that with sets and props and costumes and things like that like what's the life of them afterwards and or where did you buy them from and Totally. And even the cost savings that can come from that. I remember talking to this to this production company and, um, you know, they were talking about scaffolding and they were going to like build it all from scratch. But actually they realized renting it is so much more sustainable, A, but they also saved a ton of money. But mm -hmm. I think films are just like, let's go, 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 go. That it happens yeah. so fast that they're like, they don't realize that there are so many sustainable cost savings opportunities. I think that's the same with technology. I mean, you know, you're when when I was at film school, you know, you're very much like taught to rent from, you know, you either borrowed equipment that we had at film school or obviously every production you're on, you're renting your lighting, your cameras. And you yeah. realize, you think at one point, you're like, oh, I want to own a camera that's, you know, really special. But technology moves so fast that you're going to buy something that then becomes obsolete in a few years time. Mm -hmm. And I think renting equipment will become, in the same way that that's how people you know, travel or live, I think in a much more rented kind of way, we don't necessarily have to own things from new, essentially, or like secondhand, purchasing secondhand things.
I agree. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? I'm trying to think what we haven't chatted about. We've been all over the map. <laughs> I know. Well, everywhere. Um, I'm looking. Zero waste. Oh, hair stylist in the industry. Some, I mean, there's so many, there's so many industries where like, I want these champions of each industry to start coming out. Like you're, you're definitely, um, the most vocal in film that I know around mm -hmm. sustainability, zero waste. And, you know, I went to Gabriella Hurst's show in New York. She's a fashion designer and she had a totally zero waste backup house, which was really amazing. Like you don't even think about how much waste is produced in eventing even like Mm -hmm. creating events there's so much waste and garbage produced um like fashion shows corporate events so i mean we're, we're not even we haven't even started talking about that yet but like think of all the events that were canceled because of covid and how many sure, events yeah. are happening and how much waste that's preventing because of that definitely yeah yeah it's kind of the yeah for sure and just we just it can just happen so easily how much you know things will you know events will be designed or things will be made and then now because we can't do that or even when we come back to it it's like will they be needed and i think for me that's what you know being choosing a lower impact lifestyle is literally about slowing down with the choices that you're making i mean that's how it happens and i think that's what's happening with this time is we quickly rush to grab things without thinking like, oh, actually, wait, what's that made of? What's it packaged in? Oh, let me look at the ingredient list. And just in that one moment of just like slowing down with the immediate grabbing of things as a consumer, you like all these pings go off and you're like, oh no, wait, that's not good to actually wait. Do I even need this? No, I'm fine. I've got something the same at home. I don't even need to buy this. So I think it's like a good slow, slow decision making is best. I wonder if those events and things will just slow down. I, I, I heard about, you know, virtual conferencing will start happening more as opposed to, to having all these big conferences and like trade shows, which are so wasteful. Like, I don't know if you've ever been to Expo West in Anaheim, but it's a natural product expo where everything is literally packaged in plastic. It's the most contradictory, like, oh, no. thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, but things like that, even there, there's so much waste generated. And I, I actually think there is a lot of really beautiful stuff that will come out of this in terms of just like fewer events that are so waste generating. I saw someone comment about even for, for film production, like flying everyone everywhere and flying things places. I wonder what the future of, I mean, this is an interesting question for you, but just like what the future of production will look like. Do you think that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Cause <laughs> it's hard. Cause also every, if, if people are, I mean, I've consumed, as we were saying, so much more television and film than I ever do. And I thought I watched a lot of films, but I have watched even more. And so the content needs to, that needs to keep going because people are still going to want to watch new shows, yeah, new I things. Know. So slowly we're going to run out of the new things that were produced before this time. So I do think production will resume, but I think the scale in which it is done will be different you know you can make things on much more skeleton crews of people less people you know maybe not as being using limitations of filming actually as a um way to inspire new ideas and like be more resourceful and creative with like how okay how are we going to film this it has to all be where we're all based it has to be only a 10 person crew you know making it more localized I, I, it's so interesting. I think about that because on my street in Brooklyn, they're literally filming every day something new. Um, and I just see people like sitting around all the time. And I'm like, do they need all of these? Yeah. Like, do they have a job? Do they know what they're doing here? It's so funny that the scale is different. You know, you go on one film set or, you, or for me, things I've done, you feel like you're doing every single job because there's just not enough of you because yeah. there's just no budget. And then by comparison to sets that I started on with Harry Potter, I mean, it was just literally thousands of people. I mean, so crazy. Yeah. And just so, and yes, I, at one point they all had a job and they all kind of make it turn and go around. But the scale, I think, films what can't. I think also you will look insensitive as a production making something to that, like that wastefully. I think people will be like, won't want to be behind you mm -hmm. if you're not trying at least to be more conscious. Yeah, I mean, there's gonna have to be a big unraveling of the way that things were done before. Um, even just like trying to work with this 
this crew that I was talking to about, you know, even switching up their craft services to more sustainable options, having refillable water stations. Like, it's so, because it's such a high intensity, you have like 40 days to do something and you can't, like, you can't fuck it up. Um, you know, it's so, I think, disarming or like, I, or alarming to to change up those systems in a process that's like that needs to be so tight um yeah i think people as well just don't allocate enough you know you need to right at the beginning allocate someone who that is their job i mean yeah. i think there will be definitely a whole new i hope department that expands for the kind of that and that's why companies like that we mentioned like earth angel and things will be those people that will literally need to be hired it's just whether or not there's the budget to allocate for that. I saw someone ask, I know we're getting to the end of our time, but I, I'd be curious to hear this from you as well, but um, like resources that you've used to, to learn about sustainability. And I could say ones that have been really impactful for me. Um, the, the book that really changed a lot for me was Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. <laughs> um, that's to date the most impactful book I've ever read. Um, all about the effects of DDT, uh, a man-made pesticide on bird populations and, and the environment and on people. Um, so if you're looking for kind of the story that launched the environmental revolution in the 1960s, it was really Rachel Carson's book. Um, also, I don't know if anyone's like teetering on vegetarianism right now, but Jonathan Safran Foer's book, um, Eating Animals, was really my, uh, my catalyst for, for being a vegetarian for six years. Um, and also the documentary King Corn Mm -hmm. is really good have you seen that i haven't seen that no it's it's all about growing like monocrop corn you know like the cash crop of corn. oh right yeah yeah of course. Um, and they make high fructose corn syrup and they grow this corn and they try to eat it and they're like oh this tastes like shit and then they're like wait this is the foundation of effectively like our whole american food system um so that's a really good one um trash is for tossers you can always go to and have package free we we try to put out a lot of information also the documentary gasland um really changed my my life in a huge way and got me involved in like grassroots activism and protesting it's all about hydro fracking and um the impacts on people in the environment and fracking like i was saying before is is one of the top three drivers of methane which is is worse than carbon dioxide as a, as a warming gas what are you i'm curious to hear what your your favorite um are. silent spring i really love as well that was a great book i remember reading and just again i think important to see and hear how long this has been going on for you know we are not Yes, obviously, different brands are popping up now, such as your own and this being on the forefront of the agenda. But we also just being like so aware of people who have been fighting this fight for like a really long time and understanding the work they've already done and what we're coming in to kind of mm -hmm. continue and support, I think is always important to kind of understand. Um, I think it's hard for me. I feel like most of my like, resources often come i mean i do love watching documentaries but i find sometimes they can be like quite paralyzing <laughs> yeah. and i just feel totally stuck <laughs> um uh, i'm actually doing a panel on saturday about this new film called the story of plastic which is actually a great mm. film if anyone wants to watch it i linked it in my stories and it's free to watch until saturday send it to me after this yeah yeah i'll send it to you and i'm doing tonight. A, and it basically connects the plastic industry, the fossil fuel industry, the story of plastic and how it was kind of sold when it first came about as a material, how it was just kind of sold essentially to the world and how um, much money is made from it and how much kind of corruption is behind the two industries. Um, so that was a really good film for me just to kind of remind me of things I already knew, but also connect dots that I didn't connect before. Um, and... I take weirdly like a lot of my like reference from for my work and the lens of sustainability through more like genre stuff like sci-fi and dystopian kind of stuff just to sort of like see where my mind can go if we were to go down an extreme what's your um, what's your favorite ooh, um i love ex machina that's my that's oh my yeah favorite. my one of my favorite films is children of men which obviously talks about essentially population um, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of immigration and, and refugees, essentially. Um, but another resource, I think when people ask, like, oh, what can I do or what's a resource? And I think as much as we can, for sure, be aware more of our personal choices, day-to-day -day impacts, I also think, you know, we have to realize that we also 
need to put the um, the responsibility back on our governments, back on the kind of big corporations, and know that like we should be calling people out and kind of not taking on this whole um, climate crisis on our own kind of back. So I think if you could find like a local um, environmental like nonprofit in your neighborhood is a really amazing way to to get involved and like meet other like-minded people you don't necessarily have to go for big mm -hmm. organizations like i've mentioned greenpeace but you could find more like local chapters of big organizations or smaller um organizations because i think they're great resources of like what you could be doing actually in your local area it's such a good point like as opposed to trying to change like take down halliburton you know, yeah. you could work on local ordinances to, to yeah, start changing sure. things and, and that has a ripple effect. I think, you know, something that I think about is just local officials and, and how little people pay attention to that sometimes. Like mm -hmm. my, my favorite local official was Rafael Espinal, who um, was was running for uh, a, a, the second highest position in, in New York City government. So it's like who takes over if the mayor dies. Um, and he lost and it was so sad because he had some of the most environmentally progressive initiatives that I'd ever heard, you know, um, even looking, we have a, a presidential election coming up, um, Joe Biden, who wasn't ever going to be my first choice, you know, said in the elections, one of the first things he would want to do is end oil and gas subsidies. That is one of the most majorly positive things that could happen for the environment ever. Um, and so it's just like paying attention to those things and voting and electing officials that, that have the cojones to like go out and, and actually do something about this because ending fossil fuel subsidies would be tremendously impactful for not just oil and gas, but for everything that comes packaged in plastic because it would no longer be um, like incredibly inexpensive to, to manufacture. Mm -hmm. And so that would just change the whole game and level the playing field in such an amazing way. Yeah, I do also wonder if like after this time plastics will become as fossil fuel companies will get a hit in in the economy. Like I wonder if like plastic prices will go up. I kind of hope they do. I don't think so because the, the cost of oil is so cheap. Yeah, it's really now. cheap. I mean here you just like pass gas stations and it's like half the price of the world yeah. a few weeks like, ago. I mean it's basically free. It's so yeah. sad. But that's that's also why we need to like look at oil subsidies and subsidies of things like soy and corn and cotton um mm -hmm. the most destructive industries on our environment look at companies like Halliburton um that are that are really leading the charge of these like super destructive practices yeah and I think just to be feel empowered again of your choices that you make when you vote and and or even vote with your money when you you're essentially voting with your money when you buy things you are that yeah. you know knowing that yes, sometimes we can just feel like data, but we can also be positive data. Um, I have 4% yeah, on... battery left. The okay. last thing I'll say, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like checking. Um, at Package Free, we did this really cool initiative that I was really proud of, which was like taking these big, you know, global issues and distilling them down into consumer choices that could impact them, mm -hmm. even, you know, I'll be in a small way, but, but a way nonetheless. So, um, you know, if you care about ocean health, there are things as simple as using a guppy bag or reef safe sunscreen. Um, you know, if you care about deforestation using, um, you know, FSC certified products or staying away from plastic or, um, you know, these simple things that seem like small choices, but directly contribute to reducing um, the overall problem. So I think it is important to think about that a little bit and, and ask yourself first, like, what's this huge issue that I'm passionate about? And what are the, the little choices that I can make that can positively impact it? Definitely. And also narrowing that down, because I think it can be overwhelming suddenly trying to overhaul your whole home and all your habits. Yeah. So choose, I would say, like one, whether or not, like you're saying, through the lens of the, something that you care about, whether it's the oceans mm -hmm. or forests, or whether it's like, okay, I'm going to start with my kitchen or my beauty products or my laundry kind of things like just starting with one kind of manageable chapter first yeah. and for the love of god just don't start throwing everything away <laughs> no don't use everything you have already first <laughs> that's not yeah for sure um my phone is about to die <laughs> okay well lovely <laughs> we, we i'm glad to chat live and thanks everyone for joining you i'm so happy to see you and hope Me to see you in yeah in, in the real world <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for watching. Thanks, everyone.